So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session on embodied carbon and MEP. So on behalf of the Boston Society, there we go. On behalf of the Boston Society for Architecture, thank you for joining the fifth session in Embodied Carbon 101, the BSA's 12-part program series taking part this summer. So following up on Embodied Carbon in Buildings Conference that the BSA presented in 2019, this series will bring you up to date on embodied carbon programming almost every Monday, providing foundational knowledge in different impact areas and giving you tools and takeaways that you can apply to your everyday work. So we, today we are gonna have the fifth um, of this series on uh, MEP systems. I'm Stephanie Carlisle, a principal and environmental researcher at Kieran Timberlake, an architecture planning and research firm located in Philadelphia. And I'm joined today by a series of amazing presenters, um, Julie Jinsky from a principal at Borough Happold in Boston, Jacob Knowles, Director of Sustainability at BR Plus A in Boston, um, Ali Machaka, a, a Senior Associate at Thornton Tomasetti in Boston, and Kelsey Watilla, a Research Fellow at SQ Dumas Ripple in New Orleans. So I want to take a really quick moment to start to thank all our sponsors for the series. Um, that's Arc Woods and Services, Goody Clancy, Huber Engineered Wood, Kingspan, Nordic Structures, Select Building Products, and Thought Forms. We're very, very thankful for your support and this project couldn't have happened without it. Um, we also want to thank our partners, the Associated General Contractors in Massachusetts, Built Environment Plus, the International Living Futures Institute, and the Structural Engineering Institute. And finally, I want to recognize that the program series is supported by the Carbon Leadership Forum and its local knowledge community, CLF Boston, which we invite you to join if you're interested in continuing the conversation and learning more about how to participate in deep decarbonization work on your projects and in a larger community. So before we dive in, a couple final notes about the program. So continuing education credits are available for those who are eligible. We'll share a link in the Google Forms in the chat box shortly. If you want continuing ed credit, please add your name, email address, and AIA number in the chat. If you're not an AIA member but want a certificate, please enter your name and email address, and we will get that to you shortly. We are recording the session, and it will be posted on the BSA website. Um, architects.org later this week for you all to access. So we ask that you share any questions uh, during the session using the Q&A function. We're going to try to keep things really casual, but also keep them moving through each of the presenters. And we might not be able to get to all of your questions today, um, but hopefully we'll use them to inform future programming and continue the conversation. And with that, let's begin. So I'm going to spend just a few really, really quick minutes um, grounding everyone in the topic for today, and then we'll pass it on to the other presenters that are going to expand on all of these points and also show some really interesting case studies. So hopefully, if you've attended any of the previous sessions, you're all caught up on the topic of embodied carbon. But just in case, um, I want to make sure we're all grounded in the fact that of what embodied carbon is. So embodied carbon are the carbon emissions, of course, associated with materials and construction processes throughout the entire life cycle of a building or an infrastructure project. So that's beginning with resource extraction and manufacturing, going through construction, use, occupancy, maintenance, demolition, and end of life. So for the last two weeks, we've covered some of the most important and substantial elements in the building from a carbon perspective, uh, structure and envelope. Um, you might be familiar with uh, the scope or building elements that are broken down in life cycle assessment or other types of analysis um, from this list. Um, and indeed, um, often when we call things a whole building LCA model or WBLCA, um, many of those models only take these limited building elements into consideration. Um, and most, most tools, most data sets, really tend to focus on structure and enclosure. Some will also include interiors, which is gonna be in the next session in this series, but very few models, tools, or case studies have really looked in depth um, at what is sometimes called additional scope items, or those trickier building elements like MEP, landscape, and ff &E, which is exactly what we're gonna start crawling into. So I just wanna call that out as 
it's really exciting to have some space to talk about this topic and also just acknowledge that this is kind of the cutting edge of LCA right now. So all the presenters today, as well as other researchers mentioned, are really trying to figure out how to conduct these studies, what tools are out there, and how to really share their research. So in some respects, embodied carbon accounting is really, really simple. So first, we just figure out all the materials and systems in a building. We take that material inventory. We apply embodied carbon or other environmental impact coefficients from LCA databases and tools that translate all the inputs and outputs associated to those materials or products over their full life cycle, we put them all together and poof, we get some sort of embodied carbon figure in total or spread out over time. So of course, this is not simple. This is a complicated practice. It's one we're all getting used to doing, um, but at, at its really basis, I find it pretty helpful to just point out there's kind of these two critical um, components of all LCA models. Um, fortunately, this slide also points to two big challenges in LCA for MEP. It's currently really challenging to perform material takeoffs, so that's actually figuring out what's in my building, how much of it do I have, and it's also pretty hard still to find reliable data at sufficient resolution for analysis. So that's the how is it made, what are all the inputs and outputs, and what's an embodied carbon figure that I can use for all these pieces of equipment. So I'm just going to mention really quickly two projects that I think laid some foundational work on this topic. Um, and really, these slides are also just up here for your reference. So I'll speed through them in just about a minute. Um, so the first are really, these are both projects run by the Carbon Leadership Forum. Um, they conduct, started an MEP and also tenant improvement benchmarking study about uh, two and a half years ago. The whole report was published in 2019, and I mention that because you can dig into it in great depth um, on the CLF website. Um, it's also very interesting that this is run by the CLF because it means that all of the data, the toolkit that was made is all public source available for you to use. Um, so this study was run by uh, Barbara Rodriguez. It was part of her PhD work at University of Washington, and she really set out with a large team to figure out how much does MEP really matter, and how could we start to at least get a little bit of data on this topic. Um, so this study looked at uh, abandoned mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, also looked at tenant improvements, but we won't go into that. Um, and what she did was really model out 16 hypothetical commercial buildings, a small, a medium, and a large system, and then also tried to look at what she would consider a standard mechanical system as well as high performance buildings. So they engineered the systems as a design team, conducted really detailed material takeoffs, um, it's only looking at A1 through 3, um, so that's the manufacturing stage impacts, and then they used uh, environmental product declarations and quartz data uh, to gather the uh, carbon footprints. So what they found was pretty interesting. They found that, of course, mechanical equipment uh, is large, it's heavy, and it actually is pretty impactful. Um, their estimates put it at about 40 to 75 kilograms CO2 equivalent per meter square, so in a ballpark, depending on your building, that could be anywhere from 10 to 20% of your total in body whole building LCA. Um, they also really called attention to this topic of refrigerants, which are not included in this graph, as being a really, really important element to study, which I think some of the later presenters are going to get into. Um, the second point that I just wanted to make at a high level, because you'll hear this brought up again, is just, so not only are these high impact MEP items like air handling units, ductwork, light fixtures, et cetera, big heavy things in the building, but also it's really important for us to think over time with LCA and start to think about which of these systems continue to get replaced over the life of the building and how those estimates really impact the full life cycle, not just the initial construction. Uh, this project was followed up uh, by another application on a real building. So this was using a similar methodology, but using um, in collaboration with WeWork, looking at a commercial office space um, also conducted in 2019. And here the researchers found very similar findings. So here the, um, the uh, total carbon footprint of MEP was actually even a little bit higher than was estimated in the previous study. But again, a lot of attention going to LED fixtures, um, air handling units, et cetera, as well as some of the sheet metal throughout the entire building. Um, this study also points out that while we're talking about carbon, it's actually really important for us to think across all impact categories and a full LCA assessment will also help you understand um, other types of environmental toxicity issues like ozone depletion, et cetera, that are a really big part of bringing together conversations, particularly around refrigerants, foams, blowing agents, et cetera. So 
So I'll just leave with a couple takeaways from these two studies. One is that it's probably really important for us to start talking about MEP and considering these systems, and they can make a really significant contribution to global warming potential on our projects. Um, there's a lot of information we don't know and data that we need, but there's also some rules of thumb that still work here. So large, heavy, expensive pieces of equipment usually actually matter, right? Uh, big pieces of metal, whether it's steel framing or structure or mechanical equipment are gonna have high GWP. Um, remember to account for a full life cycle of your project. That's really gonna start amplifying those numbers with equipment replacement, refrigerant leakage, et cetera. Um, and it's pretty likely that we're actually dramatically undercounting these figures. Um, and as the data improves, it's pretty likely that they will increase. Um, just because something is included from scope in LEED or some other assessment doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Um, and also this final point I wanted to make that expanding scope I think isn't always just about the sheer numbers, but sometimes it's also really about expanding collaboration across our teams. So five things you can do on your project, and then I'll pass this on. Uh, we really need to advocate for greater data transparency and EPDs from North American suppliers. Um, we should push for inclusion of MEP systems and refrigerants uh, in, existent, in existing and future tools so it's easier to do these assessments for everyone. Um, that you should bring your MEP consultants on board and start to engage in these conversations even if the data is not quite there yet. Um, and that the data analysis doesn't really need to be complex. So we can still use some of these rules of thumb that guide other LCA work. Um, and finally, just all of us really wanna encourage folks to continue exploring the topic on your projects and share more case studies. So to that effect, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kelsey um, to share the first case study for today. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, so as we swap over here to have me share my, my slides, um, I'm just gonna mirror that these action items and takeaways are all things that um, my case study I'm about to present has um, has has uh, has shown and demonstrated is um, that while we've got a lack of uh, research that's still doable, we can still get some baseline understanding of what MEP systems impacts are on embodied carbon. And obviously, with MEP systems, um, there's also a bit to weigh with operational carbon. Mm -hmm. So what I'm about to talk about is one case study in particular of an office building renovation in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And the renovation came about um, due to concerns of occupant comfort. Um, so it was largely a mechanical system upgrade, but it presented an opportunity to look at the embodied carbon of the whole renovation cycle and include MEP work into um, that measuring. So just really quickly, the question I was trying to answer in examining this project was, what is the embodied carbon impact of MEP systems for office renovations? I also want to note that when I started this work, that was right about when the CLS study came out. So that was both a really great resource and guidance and um, helped me to kind of try and stick to a consistent procedure, which is one of the big things as we're starting to add scope to to LCA that having a consistent um, procedure and method will help make the overall data set comparable. Um, so just really quickly about the project, this was an interior renovation with an MEP upgrade. The project's in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, so it's a climate zone 2A, cooling diamond dominated climate. It's about 12,000 square meters, eight stories, and the MEP system upgrade was simply lighting upgrades and an air, heat, and cooling system distribution change. It wasn't um, an o a complete overhaul. There was some co equipment we were able to reuse. Um, this project was LEED certified um, after the system upgrades. Um, so in order to understand the overall impacts, I just kind of wanted to compare this initially to build the case for building reuse. So using the carbon leadership construction um, survey, uh, building this building new, a typical concrete and steel construction built today, about the same square footage, would have been um, 425 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. 
we ran a complete LCA of the as-built structure, and it came to about 420 kilograms of CO2 per square meter, which is well within the overall range that the CLS reports. Um, but like I said, the focus of this study is the interior renovation. So that includes demolition impacts of kind of what you can see on the screen here, getting rid of old carpet ceiling walls, um, and then the new uh, partitions going in. And that ends up being about 50 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. Um, so overall, we're saving a lot of carbon by avoided emissions. Um, and that's it. Sorry, that. Um, just really quickly, it's about 12% of the carbon, the embodied carbon that would be spent to build new to do this renovation. And that also presented the opportunity to measure this building's MEP system carbon. Um, just a quick little peek of the space, it's under construction right now, but um, the client was really concerned with occupant comfort. That's how the whole retrofit came to be. Um, they knew that their occupants were too hot, so they thought they needed a bigger MEP system. Um, this is also a really great example of design and MEP working together. So by optimizing the space for daylight, manipulating the floor plate and layout, um, or the use of the floor plate in layout to take people away from the windows where they were being overheated, um, helped us to realize that, no, you don't actually need more brute force to cool your building. We just needed some smarter use of space. Um, and, and in that, that is how we were able to also recognize that we could keep a lot of the mechanical equipment in the project. Um, so those mechanical system upgrades, like I said, we were able to ma maintain a fair amount of the actual equipment. Um, so the central plant was maintained. We simply switched the the distribution system from a VAV, variable air volume, to a VRF, a variable refrigerant flow system. Um, we did lighting upgrades. This project was built in 1984. The lighting had never been upgraded, so that was a huge energy savings in updating to LED fixtures. And altogether, this brought our building site EUI from 93 to 27 kBTUs per square foot per year. So we cut it in about a third. Um, but like we said, we're interested in the embodied carbon of that as well. So working together with our MEP engineers, um, we were able to measure the embodied carbon, the material quantities of the ductwork, the plumbing, the electrical, lighting, and the new mechanical equipment equipment that was brought into the project um, and run that through a dynamo script through Revit, but also compare our material quantity takeoffs with their um, actual on-site material quantity takeoffs and estimates. So getting to compare our numbers that way. And um, overall, we fall in that same range of the CLF survey uh, with the embodied carbon impacts being about 35 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. Um, just quickly, that ends up being about 40% of a renovation impact. Um, so it's significant. It's, it's enough to measure and pay attention to, um, even though it's a small number, especially in renovations, it's, it's an, a point where we can improve and um, optimize. But like I said, and like we all know, um, MEP has to do with operational carbon, so we wanted to see what the operational carbon payback was. So this is a quick chart showing the building from 1984 up to its, um, the embodied carbon and operational use to 2030. So that's showing that high IUI of EUI of 93, and that equates on the Louisiana grid to about 140 kilograms of CO2 per square meter per year. Um, but as we know, that's not what we did. We did a building renovation in 2020 and dropped that EUI significantly. So here we can see how much carbon we're saving by doing that initial upfront carbon of 85 for the entire project, the MEP system, and the interior renovation. We bring our operational carbon down to 45 kilograms of CO2 per square meter um, with a low EUI of 27. And that ended up meaning saving in just 10 years 950 kilograms of CO2 per square meter um, in the project operationally. Um, but like Stephanie also pointed out, and as I mentioned, we switched to a VRF system, and one of the things 
that's a constant uh, topic of conversation is just how scary are refrigerants? Is it something we need to monitor? Is it something we need to measure? So we did measure our uh, refrigerant leakage rates, which I'm about to get into. But first, I wanted to break down a little bit more of the components of the mechanical system. So like we said, overall, the mechanical system itself is about 35 kilograms of CO2 per square meter. And that was broken down into the mechanical equipment that was added, the duct insulation, duct work, the pipe insulation, and the pipe distribution, and lighting and electrical. And so here it kind of breaks down um, somewhat intuitively that the heavy equipment, the stuff with the most mass and the most quantity is what's taking up the most embodied carbon in, the, in this project. But then comparing the embodied carbon to the operational carbon over 10 years to the critical timeline of 2030, we can quickly see that operational carbon still matters quite a bit more than the MEP carbon. So that MEP upfront carbon is going to be worth that reduction um, for operational carbon. This also gets into the argument of offsetting or um, going into purchasing RECs um, for your building operations. And here, just toggling between the two, we can see a little bit, once we add in refrigerant leaks, um, using an annual leakage rate of 5%. So here's operational carbon before refrigerant leaks, and here's operational carbon once we count um, refrigerant leaks. This project used R410A and had an initial charge of about 1,500 pounds. Um, and that comes at a very high global warming potential of 2088. I should note that this is the global warming potential 100, where it may be a bit more accurate to use a global warming potential of 20 years, um, just for how the refrigerant, how long it actually stays in the atmosphere and impacts global warming. Um, but it's still a very significant amount and is about 10% of the operational carbon per year. So, um, that it still is an area of concern with today's refrigerants, which brings me to um, just breaking that down again further that you can see it's about 20% of the operational carbon in the pre project by 2030 versus the, um, the embodied carbon and the grid-related operational carbon. So this whole study really uh, presented, like I said, an opportunity for us to work with our MEP consultants and get them engaged in the topic of embodied carbon, but it, and it gave us some answers, but it did result mostly in questions. Um, one of the first answers, which is a great takeaway, is for renovations, embodied carbon is small compared to operational carbon. So doing your MEP system upgrade to bring your um, system up to date is well worth it. Um, like we just pointed out that impact of refrigerants is significant, so that's a piece to tackle, but that's today's refrigerants. Hopefully, we're all seeing now that there are more refrigerants with global warming potentials of one um, and lower, so those will be better in that impact. And then I want to leave with a couple questions that this brought for me, which is how to gather more data more consistently, which I think Julie will be talking about. They've got a great tool um, that, that helps bring this into a system and regularizes the data sets that we're using to do this rather than having a, a mix of Excel spreadsheets and Dynamo and it's an open source script that she's going to share with you. Um, the other piece is we can still make really Im impactful choices like Stephanie said, using less material is going to save us carbon. So making sure that we're routing our ducts and our pipes work efficiently um, in the system is a can still be a really impactful choice. And then the other piece is missing data. We need more information from more manufacturers and from more MEP engineers, and we need more case studies to show this. This is just one with some big takeaways, but it is just one study. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done, but I think it's an exciting opportunity. So I will leave you with that, and I believe I'm handing it off to Jacob and Alex um, with some more work on uh, lab spaces instead of office buildings.
All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. And Kelsey, that was that was very interesting uh, and a great uh, segue to our presentation. Uh, we'll be talking today about the embodied carbon of MEP systems in particular when we look to labs. Um, I am Ale Menchaca. I'm a senior associate uh, in uh, for the sustainability practice uh, for Thornton Tomasetti, and I'm based in the Boston office. Mm -hmm. um, Jacob Knowles, uh, Director of Sustainable Design at BR Plus A. And we also have listed here some of the great folks from our technical teams that helped develop the research for this presentation. So uh, what we want to talk about today uh, is focused on how we thought about this, this, this problem, this topic, was first trying to understand the first key question we had was, how does, what is the embodied carbon, what is the difference in embodied carbon in MEP system of a lab building compared to an office building? And is it more significant? We know lab buildings have more equipment. How does that compare in terms of embodied carbon? Uh, what are the largest drivers? Once we quantify that, what are the largest drivers and key opportunities? And then if we design a high performance lab, how does that embody carbon compare to a traditional lab building? Is it higher? Is it lower? We were expecting it to be lower, but we had to prove ourselves uh, for that. And then finally, we want to walk you. This was in order to answer these two key questions, we actually had to do a fair amount of work just because what has mentioned earlier, it's actually really, really, really tricky to quantify the embodied carbon of MEP system, particularly in early design or with little uh, information. And so we'll walk you through our process hiccups and successes, as well as some advice on how do you do it yourself. So why do we care? Uh, why do we care about this? Well, MEP systems have their impact or have an impact on carbon emissions at every stage of a cycle for, uh, for of the life cycle of a building, right? And so there's extractor, manufacturer, and assembly, which is what we're talking about today. There's a component for MEP. There's a component for MEP for construction, likewise for maintenance and repair. And so far, you know, we know that from an MEP system standpoint, particularly in labs, really it's the operational emissions that take up most of the impact of MEP. And so we're often focused on, well, how do we reduce that? In comparison, the embodied carbon is very small. However, if we aim to have, as we are currently aiming to have net zero energy labs, then the operational piece suddenly just gets down to zero. And so all of these other parts become more important. And so how can we focus on those parts and make a difference there? And so our key questions were, how large is the embodied carbon of MEP systems and labs? And then how is this embodied carbon impacted in high performance labs? Just to give you a sense for any one of you who has not been to a lab, uh, labs are very, very systems intensive. So it's not only the penthouse that gets much larger, but there is the piping, there is the electrical, uh, which are the other two letters in MEP that are extremely relevant to. And so our analysis looked at two developer lab buildings, one that was more of a typical all air lab, and the other one that looked at a high performance chill beams lab, so a high performance building, and we compared those two in terms of MEP. Um, and our process was as follows. We listed, we developed a list of all MEP equipment in each one of the labs. This is just a small screenshot of the actual entire list of equipment that goes everywhere from piping, valves, you know, air handler units, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, step number two was searching for available EPD information. Wherever we can save time, let's save it. And so we went online, found some EPDs for, for some systems that were not exactly the brand, but we were able to find analogous just to get a sense of what the, the embodied carbon was for that. We use one click, uh, which is the tool that, that Thorne Thomas said he uses mostly to do LCA analysis and use some of the data there uh, from their database uh, for more generic systems where we couldn't find specific EPDs. And then we also grabbed some data from the Carbon Leadership Forum, MEP calculator. Uh, most of the systems are European. Uh, but we found, uh, a, you know, a decent amount of data there that you, we could use to, to, to track. Now, there was still a fair amount that we were not able to find. So what we did was we approximated by weight uh, for the systems that we were missing. 
we had the information of the shipping weight from subcontractor submittals. And so we grabbed the weight and compared uh, and, and tried to approximate that way. And we'll tell you where it worked and where it didn't work. Uh, the last step was we validated through benchmarking. And so using the study that was mentioned uh, earlier by Stephanie, we actually compared the values we were getting. Um, uh, we compared them to, we actually did a very similar analysis just to an office and we compared that to the values we were getting just order of magnitude and compared the ones, I mean, it was very rough, like for, for an office, it was just double check. We mostly focused on labs, but we also wanted to compare, well, how does this compare to an office? And is it, you know, does it make sense, right? And so if we, for example, if we had a result that was 30 times larger, but in reality, we don't have 30 times the, the amount of systems, you know, then we would go back and just try to understand why our estimations were not, you know, were not aligned. And so we try to do as much benchmarking as we could given the information available. So not surprisingly, the result came out that the uh, lab building is significantly higher embodied carbon for the MEP systems. And in addition, it's a higher percent of a lab buildings total is MEP systems compared to a typical office building. And here's why, which is they are basically a rat's nest of MEP systems. If you take an x-ray through a building, that's basically uh, you know all the veins and arteries and nerves are all the MEP systems. And for the half a million square foot building that we were looking at, we were able to account for over 2 million pounds of MEP systems. And so how does that break down? Here is the embodied carbon of what we were able to identify. You can see the big drivers are labeled here in this graphic. Uh, the air handlers, the ducts, the piping, the refrigerant leakage. And then above that, we have the fit out duct work and the fit out piping. So that's all the mechanical for the year one embodied carbon um, equipment. And then we have on top of that, the electrical for the core shell in light green and then the fit out in dark green and then the plumbing for the core shell in light blue and the fit out in the dark blue. Now, if you extend that from your initial outlay of embodied carbon to the full 60 year life cycle, you can see that all of those fit out chunks get much larger because they're being replaced as they renovate, they're being replaced as the equipment ends its life cycle, you know, its lifespan. And so we're having a significant increase due to replacement of that equipment over time. And what we end up with over that 60 years is the MEP FP systems adding up to a very large percentage of the total. Here we're projecting in the range of 42% for a high you know, high intensity lab building. And um, so it's no longer a negligible kind of asterisk at the end of an, of an LCA. It is a, a critical component for this type of building. So in terms of opportunities to reduce the embodied carbon, we compared, as Ale mentioned earlier, an all air kind of conventional lab building to a high performance chill beam design. And you can see on the right is our chilled beam design. And you can see that you can almost not even see the little stripe that represents the actual embodied carbon of the chilled beams. And there was a small uptick in the, um, in the hydronic embodied carbon to distribute the water to those zones. Um, my dog is having a party with our squeak toy. Um, and, uh, but there's huge savings in terms of the air handlers, and central duct work and uh, the chiller plant and, and other elements that actually in, in total have a significant savings for embodied carbon. Now, this, this design that we were targeting is, is um, going from pretty conventional lab building to a very high performance, very low carbon operation for energy consumption. And so unfortunately the embodied carbon, the savings wasn't as large for embodied carbon as it was for operational energy carbon. Um, but still nice to know that they're both headed in the right direction. So you get a, a yes and result here. And so some of the lessons learned, well, certainly one of the lessons learned is that this is not simple. It is not easy to get the information that one needs to really calculate this accurately. There's very few EPDs out there for products relevant to, uh, particularly to a lab building. 
So we ended up doing a lot of extrapolation based on, on weight of equipment, knowing what materials it's made of and, and the embodied carbon of that type of material. Um, for electrical, uh, a lot of LCA is done by length of wire, and that's not really great for labs. Uh, it's not easy to identify that number, number one. And number two is this uh, potentially larger gauge wire in a lab building, so length is not a great metric. So we did try to do it by weight, and it resulted in a huge overestimation of the embodied carbon. Uh, just It was coming out with a number that just wasn't plausible compared to like an office building benchmark. So we ended up having to to use the office benchmark and try to adjust based on um, how much more electrical infrastructure does a lab have versus an office building. And then for plumbing, uh, we used the weight of the systems. Uh, some of them we were able to get actual contractor weights, particularly for mechanical, we got a lot of good actual installed pounds of material. For plumbing, we did some of that also. And then again, we looked back at the office benchmark as a resource to sanity check some of our results. Thank you. Thanks, guys. I'm going to pick it up from here. So um, I'm Julie Janeski, a principal at Bureau Happold and uh, had a, a lot of help putting this presentation together as well. So some of those folks' names are on the screen. And uh, what we wanted to do was start out with just a little bit of information and, and try to share some lessons learned along the way in terms of where we've been with embodied carbon and how we're starting to approach it for MEP. Uh, Bureau Huppel has made some important commitments on carbon across the board, first for our own business within the year to be carbon neutral, as well as uh, looking at how to support all of our new build projects to be zero carbon by the year 2030, uh, as well as an, uh, another measurement at the year 2050. Similar to the other speakers today, there's obviously an, an opportunity here to be able to understand embodied carbon versus operational carbon, where with operational carbon, we've had a lot of emphasis around efficiency and uh, cleaning up the grid and showing what the impact is there. And on the embodied side, we certainly have some work to do. Our first foray into embodied carbon was in uh, 2014, and we learned very quickly that the very first embodied carbon project that you take on might not want to be a stadium, uh, but we did it anyway with uh, some help from Steph and her team at KT and using the tool tally to produce a 53 page report, which ultimately ended in a successful achievement of the lead, the related lead before credit, which was phenomenal. Uh, since then, a uh, second lesson that we've come across is really coming back to this question of making sure we all understand at Bureau Huffle what the differences are between the tools that we're using, the process uh, of the, the work itself, and then where the data is coming from and what the, the quality of that data is. For um, the purposes of the presentation today, I'm focusing on a tool that Bureau Huffle has been using that is an open source co-created um, tool that, and we'll share the link for that at the, end of, at the end of the show. Some of the other tools that you've heard mentioned are on the screen right now, and those inclu include Tally, uh, which is a Revit plugin, one-click LCA, which, is, which can take data from your models, EC3, which is an open source database. Um, for, the, for the Beer Happold tool that we've been developing, within the um, buildings and habitats object model, the idea is to be able to let it work with any software, gather the data from that model, assign values from EPDs or different databases to be able to generate data within the system and understand embodied carbon. The access to open source data sets has been really important in trying to figure this out. So Quartz is one of those databases. It's um, becoming out of date so it's, we, it, there's a, in, it's pretty important to try to make sure we understand the value of that data compared to other databases like the one referenced by Tally, which is maintained on a, on a yearly basis. Uh, we also have this set up to be able to query the EC3 open source database to be able to pull industry averages and or uh, data sheets from that tool. Importantly, the EC3 database right now uh, only does provide embodied carbon. It's not a full 
it doesn't provide a, the, the ability to do a full LCA like Stephanie said before in terms of being able to look at other, um, other impact categories. This one just looks at embodied carbon. The screenshot here is showing some of the examples of, of inputs and key characteristics that we're looking at in the tool that we're developing to be able to look at, to be able to um, really try to streamline and simplify the material quantity takeoff. Like Steph mentioned, this is definitely uh, a big challenge. And I think Kelsey and Jacob and Ali have all presented different ways that they've done it so far. Um, our goal is to try to help figure that out and then push that out into the world for lots of folks to be able to use. Uh, some of the key questions are with arrows. So there's a, a, an idea here of information we're able to pull from the model and then with the arrows information that we either need to look up in the specs or talk to the engineer to figure out how to answer those questions to better inform the material quantity takeoff. The rest of the tool starts to look like, uh, like this in terms of moving from inputs in the green boxes to what the process is attempting to do in the gray boxes, moving from something like um, identifying the duct objects, attaching the EPD to those objects, calculating the GWP uh, with the, the EPD reference data, and then generating um, uh, the outputs in the purple boxes, again, with the reference back to the project area input to be able to understand the kilograms of CO2 equivalent uh, against a square meter. Uh, we wanted to share just a couple of studies to share to, with uh, some examples of component studies. So um, lesson number three here is that benchmarking is difficult, which I think everybody else recognizes too. The, the rating tools off to the side are two references for what uh, folks are starting to look at as embodied carbon caps. The residential multifamily box is where we've been taking a look at the embodied carbon profile of the Passive House Tower at Cornell Tech that Vera Huffold engineered uh, and understanding what that looks like compared to the Carbon Leadership Forum benchmark. And then the, the office um, box is looking at the Santa Monica City Services Building, which is a living building challenge project uh, and attempting to compare that back to the CLF benchmark as well. The orange pieces here are where, we, where we're developing MEP information in addition to the blue bars, which are structure, foundation, and closure for a more standard version of embodied carbon analysis. And we'll come back to a couple of these. Off to the right is public assembly, only because we started with the Mercedes-Benz Stadium and we've been working on some other quite large infrastructure scale projects and, and want to be able to keep track of those as well. The Santa Monica City Services Building is 50,000 square feet. It's in construction now and hopefully finishing uh, later this year, pursuing Living Building Challenge, which is super exciting. And uh, we did a, an MEP takeoff that doesn't include everything, but does include what's on the screen shown here and came up with a result of 44 kilograms of carbon equivalent um, compared to square meters and said that's great and it looks like in our benchmarking slide later that um, that gives us a, a value lower than what the CLF is showing as an industry average which is also great compared to their medium high performance building um, but that left us with some questions still which are a obviously everything else incorporated into the MEP system but also the notion that embodied carbon uh, is a health issue and trying to understand how to, to bring those two worlds together. So within the tool, uh, the toolkit is something under development to be able to start to pull in HPD, health product declaration information at the same time as embodied, um, as environmental product declaration data so that we can start to generate analyses like the insulation example shown here that shows the embodied carbon footprint of a number of different insulation um, choices, but also shows if some of those are red list free or have a declare label and therefore provide all of us with a, a bit of an overlay to be able to make a decision that's not just about one factor, but about many. A corollary on the health side is that we often talk about VOCs and indoor environmental quality with the, the health impact of material choices but we don't necessarily think about the externalities of what that looks like, the procurement in terms of communities and, and workers that are working with those types of materials and the first responders 
uh, that come into contact with those materials uh, in the unfortunate event of a, a building burning. This is a graphic that's very similar to the issue of global warming and um, CO2 quantities, but in this case is specifically about uh, toxin, toxic materials and the growth of them over time. Uh, and, and hopefully a really powerful graphic to, to make sure everybody keeps that in mind. The second, uh, the second project and component study here is again looking at the Passive House Tower at Cornell Tech, which is 270,000 square feet. Here we started with an a embodied carbon study that was specifically looking at structure and then adding facade and using the structure foundation facade um, equation to, to sort of understand where we sit relative to a lot of other benchmarks. Uh, but while we were doing that, we, we uh, also came to the question of refrigerants and understanding that it, the re refrigerants have a big impact. And certainly in a building that's based on an air-cooled BRF system, uh, there is a lot of refrigerant in this building. And what, what does that potentially look like in this project? Um, so we tackled that, added a, a, an ability to the tool to be able to reference a database of the global warming potentials of a long list of refrigerants um, based on the EPA report that's shown on the screen. And compared to this, the Carbon Leadership Forum large high performance case, uh, what we're looking at on a refrigerant only understanding is that this project is below that. Um, but our takeaway is that the is that next gen refrigerants are near net global warming, near zero global warming potential, as Kelsey mentioned, uh, and they're readily available. We're using them in chillers on large buildings in Boston today. Uh, a lot of manufacturers are moving forward, are moving to them, uh, and we think it's, it's absolutely the right thing to have at the very top of your list when you're speaking to your engineer. So similar to everybody, there's a couple of key takeaways which we've tried to frame into a, couple of, in, into a list of key questions for you and your engineer. Um, number one, how can we use less ductwork? And the, the great thing here is that as soon as we're talking about less material, we're also talking about less cost. So this is a win-win for the construction budget on the project as well. Are there opportunities to make the sprinkler layout more efficient? As we're seeing, sprinkler piping actually has a pretty big, has a pretty significant value within the overall makeup of the MEP uh, number. Uh, ask if they're if they are aware of any EPDs or HPDs or and or if they'd be willing to advocate with their vendors to ask for them. Uh, ask what the opportunities are to use next gen refrigerants and really push for that. And then ask if if they can do embodied carbon calculations and if not, would they be able to provide some input so that you would you might be able to move that forward. Uh, this is a link to the open source BH tool. We would love to talk to you about it if you're interested. We're definitely looking for more people to collaborate. And uh, thank you very much. Sorry, just trying to unmute myself. So um, thanks everybody for those amazing presentations. There's just an incredible amount of content here. Um, unfortunately, there are also quite a few really good questions. So I just you know, wanna open up a little bit of space for Q and A um, to all our presenters and maybe bat around um, some of the topics that are in um, the chat or actually, I'm sorry, in the Q and A panel. Um, thanks everyone for adding your questions there. Um, so let's see, I think one question that I hear come up a lot and I'm curious what the rest of you think. Um, someone in the, the Q&A here asked if, if any of you, uh, Dan had a question asking for MEP systems, if any of you are seeing any correlation between cost and embodied carbon um, or have any thoughts about the cost question. And if, uh, how do we motivate our clients to take on this issue? I, I'll jump in and say, I think, uh, first and foremost, less material is less cost, whether that's structure or foundation or MEP. Um, so understanding, understanding that from the very get-go, the, the two are very closely linked. 
On the refrigerant side of things, we have seen a, a next-gen refrigerant have a small capital cost impact um, on chiller selections and really large pieces of equipment, but that feels like a very short-lived problem as all manufacturers are moving through the process of, of, of getting away from older refrigerants and moving toward the next, gen, the next generation. Yeah, and I think, you know, part of it falls on our shoulders. Um, you know, a lot of clients, I think, would be interested in this topic and, and care about it, but it's often not presented because we're so focused on energy-driven carbon. So I think, you know, particularly with things like the embodied carbon of MEP systems, it's just not something that we're promoting enough. So that's not really on our client's radar screen. I think, too, to tie into that, Jacob, um, it's part of the reason I think some of the data is missing is because it's, it's also somewhat on our shoulders to bring this to the MEP consultants. I know the second I brought it to ours, they were thrilled and excited to be a part of it. And engineers work to optimize things as it is. So getting them on our side and getting them to look to optimize their routing and ductwork um, was a really exciting opportunity for the, the uh, firm we worked with, which I probably, I don't remember if I mentioned, but I should be giving Bernhard MCC um, credit for teaming up with me on, on my study. Yeah, I feel like that's a that's a huge point that you know at least came has come up a lot when all of us have been talking together. Just this question about um, collaboration and also just opening up space for these conversations. You know, I think a lot of the questions in the QA also get at this topic of you know what are the strategies that work? How do we iterate? Like, how do we move forward? How do we move faster? Like, how do we make progress? Which is is amazing. It's where we all want to be, um, and I think it's it's really good for folks to also acknowledge and realize, you know, how um, challenging it is to do this work right now, but also we haven't even started, at least in my opinion, to find all the strategies, right? It's going to take so much more work and modeling, um, unfortunately, really hard work uh, for us to figure out, you know, what works. Um, but also just to make room for our MEP consultants to really participate in this, in this process and really like open up that space. Um, so on the topic of strategies, I'm going to try to combine a few questions here in, in the interest of time and, you know, you guys take them whatever direction. Um, you know, there's a few questions that are really, you know, coming back to that question of you know, even though we've done just a few case studies, what, what strategies do you think are really show promise or also which ones um, do you think are really ripe for study um, and interrogation? Well, I think we need to find a way to deal with MEP systems in, in the sort of same logic as going to timber frame buildings, right? Like buildings right now are, you know, huge embodied carbon and timber flips that on its head. So granted, we're probably not going to build ducks out of wood, but um, we can eliminate systems, right? Why are we aiming for, you know, incremental reductions in systems as opposed to complete el elimination? You know, if you use extremely efficient ventilation heat recovery, you can eliminate the need for preheat on your air handler. So that saves the coils, the pumps, the hydronics, potentially boilers, right? Or other heat pumps. Um, so that's, and if it's heat pumps, that's refrigerant too. So I think if we're talking about like reducing things by 10%, that's not enough. We have to look at eliminating systems that are, are wasteful if we could do it more efficiently. I'll jump in and add another thought um, and to agree with what Jacob's saying and take it one step further, I think in addition to in addition to that thinking continuing to think holistically about the building so that it's not just we're not entering this to only look at the embodied carbon of the MEP systems but really understand how it factors into the whole building, particularly with envelope and in, um, envelope performance. So uh, I didn't show this in the slides because we're still working through the details and it's not ready for prime time quite yet, but one of the key interests in looking at the embodied carbon study for the Cornell Tech Passive House project is to be able to compare operational carbon to embodied carbon because specifically because there is an embodied carbon investment in the performance of the envelope, just like Kelsey was talking about the embodied carbon investment in the, in the renovation of the systems to begin with. 
Uh, and while we were, while we're starting to see that that looks like a five or six percent embodied carbon add to be able to have a passive house quality envelope compared to a code compliant envelope over a foundation structure and closure version of LCA, it also looks like a 60% savings over the course of a 60 year life uh, building lifetime, which starts to look like it's really similar to the graphs that Kelsey was showing. So I think there's a there's a long view on on these studies that are really needed where it's it's about the operational embodied trade-off, it's about the envelope and the systems, and the envelope, what the envelope and systems will do, which is not currently incorporated into the numbers I was just saying, is also downsize the mechanical systems. So we are saving on embodied carbon from having less mechanical systems because we're having a more robust envelope. Yeah, we need those durable long life systems to be the right things to invest in and have low embodied carbon in the insulation and things like that. Because if you can avoid the mechanical system, you know, if you can make it smaller, then you're replacing that mechanical system, you know, say once or twice or three times during the building's life cycle. So that, as we've seen, really adds up. So there's a big opportunity when you can reduce the loads. Yeah, I think for us too, for the study I presented, that was a huge opportunity to see what of occupant comfort is a design opportunity and what is a mechanical system opportunity? And that was, like I said, the client knew their, their occupants were too hot, so they thought they needed a bigger system. And through taking a look at design and where we're using the space efficiently, we were able to eliminate the need for a bigger system, still a system upgrade, but reuse the heavy, um, mechanical equipment items and so save on that embodied carbon by not having to replace heavy equipment. Kelsey, I wonder, um, and, you know, another question that's here in the, in the Q&A that I, you know, get asked a lot and, and if anyone else wants to weigh in on it um, is, I, I'm wondering if you guys want to elaborate a little bit on this topic of refrigerant leaks. Um, and uh, there's a specific question here about how you estimated the leakage rates. Um, and, uh, but maybe you might want to add to, explain to folks what that process was, but also maybe, you know, some of the challenges of that as well. Yeah, so um, for the general numbers, what I've been doing is checking um, manufacturer guaranteed leakage rates and using that as the high estimate. And I am currently partnering with multiple maintenance um, engineering firms in New Orleans to get some data on real world recharge rates. And that is uh, both exciting and a big struggle because maintenance contracts are not for the building lifespan. So you're having to juggle multiple maintenance firms who and, and track down to what building and when they did a refrigerant recharge and then from that extrapolate the refrigerant leak. Um, that said, it's a couple steps and it takes some willingness on both sides to get there, but it's not, it's not a difficult thing. Mechanical maintenance firms know how much they're putting into a building, so we can get that number. It just takes a little bit of legwork to get the quantity um, over the building lifespan. I don't know if anyone else wants to weigh in on the uh, refrigerant refrigerant question or some of the challenges with LCA data there as well. Uh, I'll just reiterate the challenge that there, there is, there's a lack of it. <laughs> so we, we have not made any assumptions on refrigerant leakage quite yet for the studies. We're hoping to be able to use information with clients in the buildings that they're actually operating to be able to understand what that looks like. But a couple of years is not really helpful in terms of showing something that's statistically significant. And uh, we've seen some reports published by various agencies that are as low as 2.5% and as high as, I think, 25%. Uh, so something in there seems like it's probably reasonable, but we're, we don't know, we don't have a really good understanding of, of what number to use yet. So all of our studies at the moment are sitting at year one and we're gathering more information to be able to move it forward to, to year 20, year 30, year 40, year 60.
Amazing. Well, um, unfortunately, there's there's a lot of really good questions in the chat still. Um, I hope that some of them can be fodder for the next couple weeks because we unfortunately are pretty much out of time. Um, so before we start losing folks, um, I just want to take Again, another moment to thank our sponsors um, for making all of this information sharing and all of this media available to everyone. Um, thank you for your support. Um, also for the partners in this series. Um, and reiterate again, if you need, in the, the last few minutes remaining, if you need those continuing ed credits, uh, reach out um, in the chat or through the Google forum that Caitlin shared, and then we'll get you hooked up with that. Um, and uh, finally, I just want to point out that um, this series is going to be continuing for the next few weeks, um, but we're taking a really quick uh, summer break. So there'll be no programming on Monday, July 6th. Hopefully you can um, find some way to be outside and safely socially distanced, but um, connected to your community. But the next series will return on Monday, July 13th with the session on interiors. Um, so tune in again in a couple Mondays and in the meantime, don't forget that you can revisit all the previous sessions, including this one, on the BSA website. Um, thank you so much for your time and your attention. I hope that you can join the CLF Boston community or another community hub if you're in another part of the country and continue the conversation. Thank you. Take care. Have a good night. Mm -hmm.